No worries. No worries. All right. We are now live. Sorry, everybody, for the delay. Um, <laughs> we're running some technical difficulties there, but no big deal. We are here now. Um, all right. Um, let me pull up this. All right. Perfect. So, all right, everybody, thank you so much. Apologize for the delay. We have Pat Stone. Pat Stone, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I I'm excited about this. So if you don't know anything uh, about Pat and why he's qualified to come on Real Migos and talk about what's happening in the market, what we're going to expect and all this fun stuff. Uh, Pat has held C uh, officer positions with three public companies and served as director on two Fortune 500 boards. The senior executive management position, including nine years as president and CEO of the nation's largest title company, chairman and CEO, CEO or co-CEO of a software company and CEO of a real estate data and information company. Uh, Pat currently serves as executive chairman and founder to the Williston Financial Group and WFG National Title, one of my favorite title companies. Uh, and he is here with us today. Thank you, Pat. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. Awesome. On top of that, Pat, I just I, I I noticed some of the other things that you have. You've got uh, accolades from Inman News. You've been featured in there. I think that's incredible. Housing Wire. Uh, you received a Vanguard Award in 2019 and 2021. Um, these are just these are incredible accomplishments. Most influential people in real estate in multiple years and serving as uh, top 101 real estate industry doers, not just talkers. I love that. So thank you very much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. Well, my 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 pleasure, and uh, you know, I have to stay out of my wife's way, so I stay busy in real estate. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm only partially joking. <laughs> uh, well, we all have wives here, so we know how that works. <laughs> we uh, we got lots of people in the chat already. Awesome. We're gonna go through and let Pat kind of talk about some things. Um, they sent me some slides that haven't come through yet, but I have some slides from an economic uh, update that he did recently with uh, Compass um, uh, Brokerage. So we'll go through those slides and let you chat and talk about this and talk, uh, you know, give us about 30 minutes. And then I know everybody's going to have lots of questions. So we're excited to answer some of those questions. So, Pat, take it away, bud. Yeah, why don't you go ahead and pull up the first slide, uh, the first slide that shows uh, the uh, graph with the first quarter being negative. Sure, I'll get that on there right now. Awesome. Boom, 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 boom. We are right here. All right, perfect. So uh, this is from uh, a thing you did recently with, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, uh, who am I talking about? Compass, there you go. All right, so walk us through it. All right, so real quickly, what you're looking at here is a, a quarterly GDP uh, graph, and you'll note that we were negative in Q1, and that just got uh, lowered again today. Uh, it was 1.5, down 1.6%. It's worth noting that this is really an unusual situation, and it was caused by two things. First, we had the biggest trade deficit we've had in a long time. Uh, we imported a lot, did not export much. And then we had a real strange first quarter in that most U.S. corporations did not restock after the Christmas holiday. And I suspect that that was largely due to the Ukraine war and real uncertainty about where we were and what was going on. So you take the trade deficit and the lack of restocking after the Christmas holiday and you end up with a negative Q1. My gut is it will be up about two and a half percent in Q2. So this is an abnormality, not a trend and not a, a precursor of a recession. It was just a strange situation. It looks to me like Q2 will be about two and a half percent. We are slowing down a little bit and there's a lot of uncertainty we can talk about with more detail. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Okay. So one thing that happened was interesting to me is with the Ukraine war virtually the all big, uh, big well-known procrastinators about the uh, economy, the people who do projections on the economy, the people that get most attention in the media about the economy, uh, they all just went really, really negative after the Ukraine war started. And the reason for that is we are a global economy. And it's really strange to me that the media can't quite get that through its head, but we are a global economy. 
We're very dependent on global trade. About 40% of everything manufactured in the world is currently manufactured by a U.S. company, and 40% of that is manufactured overseas. So we are wholly dependent on the global economy, and the Ukraine war really put a wrench in the works. Um, and two things that it's really hit dramatically, and I think everybody's aware of this already, is energy, because uh, Russia is a major oil exporter into Europe. And then food, because both Ukraine and Russia did export a lot. Ukraine was well known for exporting wheat. Uh, wheat's been up about 17 percent over where it was prior to the uh, Ukraine war. But the uncertainty around the Ukraine war makes it almost impossible to say anything with certitude about where the economy is going to go. Uh, we will need to have that war end in order to have uh, a reasonable chance of projecting things with certitude. But you can see right here that everybody kind of fell off the cliff with the with the Ukraine war starting. Uh, next slide. So one thing we have right now is very low unemployment. Go ahead to the next slide also. And then a lot of commentary about how there are more job openings there than, than there are unemployed, which is some sort of political issue. It's not at all. Uh, job openings exceeded unemployed, uh, unemployed people all the way through 2018 and 2019. We have a situation in our country where we've had a declining birth rate and then we also had uh, immigration um, edicts and rulings that have lessened the inflow of people. So we are short workers and we're going to be short workers for the foreseeable future. It really appears that we're going to have an ongoing problem unless we figure out how to have a solid, sustainable immigration program one man's opinion right off the top of my head for what it's worth. We currently educate about 250,000 foreigners a year graduate from U.S. colleges, and we mandate that they leave within six months. Let's just keep them. That would take care of a lot of problems. That would really give yeah. us a solid, uh, solid employment base. So next slide. I mean, this, uh, you know, I can't read this real well, but uh, you're looking at the wealth factor here. A uh, couple of things I have to stress, uh, you know, we really have a significant income inequality situation in the U.S. And we tend to look at about wealth in the uh, American consumer all time high. But what we're really not is breaking down between the well off versus the well off. We'll do that. In the Do we lose them again? Still there, Pat? I'm still here. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah, we can hear you now. Perfect. Yeah, sorry. Um, no quick. No problem. Can you go to the next slide there? Yeah, there you go. It's the Fred. And I, yeah, and you're, this is uh, this is kind of interesting because you're you're looking at. Uh, debt service per household on disposable income. And look how low it is. Now, again, this is an overall national average. So be real careful. Don't project this 100% across all segments of the population. But by and large, the American consumer is in very good shape as a whole and continues to be and probably has about a year's worth of savings right now because of pandemic stimulus. So American consumer has more wealth and less debt service than they've had in a long time as a whole. Next slide. Now consumer we have inflation. Index. We have the consumer price index and the personal consumption expenditures. Now the the Fed really likes uh, the PCE segment better than the CPI segment, but the CPI came out first, got a lot of attention, and caused the Fed to be fairly aggressive in raising their rates. You know the uh, the interesting thing here to me is if you can't sleep at night, take a look at how they construct these these <laughs> these these indices, because that'll put you to sleep real quick. I mean, there is uh, countless components. Some are estimated, some are guesses, some are trends. Uh, it is not an exact science. And uh, if you look at the media and you listen to what's going on, you think, well, this is really well thought out. Candidly, um, it's OK. Uh, it is not a very precise science. But I like the PCE better than the CPI overall also. And I do think. Uh, I do think we have just about topped. 
And I say that for a couple of reasons. And I'll just uh, make some comments real quickly before we go on. First of all, you know, the inflation was caused by the pandemic putting all the or, uh, or basically causing the American consumer to spend all their money on goods and not services. Uh, as you know, the economy is composed goods plus services. Well, with the pandemic, we couldn't go out. We couldn't go to restaurants. We couldn't go to movies. We couldn't do a lot of things that were technically called services. So what we did is we took the money and spent it on goods. The amount of money being spent on goods went right through the roof. The amount of money being spent on services basically stopped. Now, you compound that with supply chain issues caused by the pandemic and by the fact that we didn't have the same amount of people involved in the supply chain. Uh, so then you have people spending a lot of money on goods and the inability to get them. So the cost went up and we had a very significant inflationary shock basically caused by the pandemic and the movement of, good, of money into goods and the failure to deliver those goods very, in a very um, quick and easy manner. Now, uh, just real quickly, Goldman Sachs has a supply chain meter where they track supply chain congestion, and they, um, they had it at 10, maxed out in December of last year. Right now, as we speak, it's at five. So basically, the supply chain has loosened up dramatically. We're now spending money on services and less money on goods. So I do believe that if you take the Ukraine war out of the situation, that inflation has topped and should start trending down slightly. Uh, if the Ukraine war, and I'll get into this a little bit more in detail later, but if Perfect. the Ukraine war ends, then I think we see inflation drop fairly quickly. But we have that we have that uncertainty out there until it ends. So next slide. So you see here where the inflationary uh, uh, in growth in cost and inflation has exceeded growth in in uh, in salaries and compensation, and that will be a problem if it goes on for a long period of time. Uh, we're about a year into it now, or a little over a year into it, so we'll see where it ends up. But I think uh, I think inflation will start coming down. Next slide. When so. Uh, Will you give us an idea of when you think that uh, inflation will start coming down? I think it already has started down. Really? Okay. Yeah, I think it's going to trend down gradually. Um, it won't drop radically because, again, the uncertainty around energy and food because of the Ukraine war. But we are seeing, uh, we are seeing, I'll show you a little bit more here in a second, but we are seeing that the supply chain has loosened up and that the amount of dollars being spent on goods versus services is going down. So it's getting less out of balance. It's interesting. You know, one thing, you know, I'm sorry to take you off your topics here um, and we can keep going, but one question I've always had and in, in conversations that I've had and I've, and I've uh, made comments, people writing comments on this channel is, um, you know, in order to keep inflation coming down even faster, I know, you know, Ukraine does put a monkey wrench in this, but if we were to start drilling oil again and opening up and allowing the free <laughs> drilling, I guess, of, of oil again, would that help inflation as well? Well, I think if you could get that to market right away, yes. Um, you know, that's a function of how long it could take to get, to, get it to market. Um, it is definitely a byproduct of accessibility and supply, the cost of oil going up. And uh, a lot of it is because, you know, the that Europe uh, basically lost its major source of oil from Russia. And consequently, that the demand on uh, other supplies went up dramatically and the supplies didn't. So, uh, yes, if you could get it to market quickly, it would make a difference. I do think... Uh, it would would take a while to do, so there may be other choices. I will see. Yeah, I saw uh, I saw Macron talking to Biden at the G was a G twenty summit, and he to ask them to to open up the supply that they've run out. Uh, I thought yeah. that was pretty interesting. So continue. Sorry. So I made a comment earlier about how the the income inequality is fairly is getting more pronounced. And I'm, I'm going to tell you just and I'm not going to get political in this conversation. I was I grew up in North Dakota. I was a uh, I was a Eisenhower fan and a Republican early, early in my life. I've had ups and downs, changes and gone both ways in the interim. But uh, I do worry about the long term health of our society because I think income inequality is getting to be an issue. 
This slide here shows the percentage of dollars being spent on food and energy by uh, five different quintiles in our population. So in other words, the top, the top 20% of America spends about 7% of its take home pay, disposable income on gas or food and energy. The bottom 20% spends over 30% of its take home pay or disposable income Jeez. on food and energy. So the different, the impact of this is dramatically different depending on where you are on the income scale. And this is scary because you can't spend 30% of your disposable income on food and energy and, and, and really have a life because you don't have enough money left over to take care of things. So uh, hopefully this gets corrected fairly soon. Next slide. And here you see the, uh, so with all the things that are happening and looking at these five uh, quintiles of income again and seeing what the actual change in income is for each quintile, you can see that the top 20%, even after all the inflationary pressures, uh, they've actually had a small marginal increase in income. Uh, the next to 20 percent just a slight decline but basically the top 60 percent of americans have been relatively un unimpacted if you will by this inflationary pressure because of the pandemic and the ukraine war you get down to the bottom 20 percent they're getting clobbered and you can see very clearly next slide so fed uh, fed really raised rates uh you know we can we could probably have about an hour of conversation on their timing and how they maybe were a little slow to the party uh, and you can see here they raised the most aggressive rate hike since 1994 and raised up to about 1.75 the fed rate is going to get up to about three and a half uh probably in the next uh, 120 days next four months uh and that wow. will kill inflation. I mean, it's going to go up rapidly. But to give you some historical perspective, take a look at the next slide. Okay, here's the Fed funds rate going back to 1960s. And you, this also includes the recent rate uh, increase. But you can see that uh, we are still at relatively low Fed fund rates, uh, looking at a historical basis. Now, I started in the real estate industry in 1975. Uh, it was uh, it was really interesting for about the first 20 or 30 years of my career. One thing we have seen here, and this goes back to the globalization I was talking about in the global economy, we've seen interest rates drop. The reason for that is global we're you're 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 breaking up there pat the the last the last couple things you said we haven't heard at all uh getting a little better Can you hear me? What if I add this one back in and take this out? There we go. Oh, here we go. Hold on. Sorry for the technical difficulties, everybody. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, all right, try again. For our end, too. Can you hear me? All right, go. Yeah, we can get, we got you. Oh. He just he just signed out. All right, he'll be back in a second. Yeah, I apologize, everybody. We we uh before the live stream, he started in and we were going back and forth trying to get him in. So um so far to wrap up what's what's happening is we've talked about, you know, um some of the things that have been happening. Uh, obviously, one of the, my big takeaways was, you know, the the gasoline had had that happen, uh, you know. Anyway, whatever. I don't even know what I'm saying. Ian, jump I in. I know what you were saying. You're saying if we, <laughs> I would, just want to if get we would drill here, it would help. But also yeah. the cost of gas affecting people in the lower 25% um, uh, of income. Yeah, that's tough. So like when you look at this chart that's up on the screen, my first thought. So in 1980, what were house prices? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the tough part. Yeah, know. and it's not just what were house <laughs> prices, but it's also what were 
the incomes relative to the house prices right. in 1980, right? right? So people were able to absorb a 20% rate a little bit better, I think. Right. No, right? I, no, no, no. Okay, here we go. He's back. <laughs> no, there were no mortgages. I, uh, my first management job in this industry was 1983. And uh, I think we, I think we were doing about two uh, percent of all real estate transactions that had a mortgage at that time. It was mostly done so through very back finance. People paying cash. Uh, real estate contracts, where they were basically the seller would sell on a contract to the buyer. So, so like, uh, uh, what happened is the SNL industry went under because they changed the. Uh, well, there was some financial problems, but then they changed the requirements for SNLs on their balance sheets, their asset requirements. And the SNL industry was the mortgage industry. There was no, there was no GSEs then. So basically you had seller carry back financing for a while and, and real estate got just, uh, I'll gotta tell you right here, like for example, in the Portland market, um, we were probably doing 5% of the amount of business we're doing right now. So it was pretty bad. It was, it was, it was very tough and uh, it's not analogous to right now in any sense of the word. So um, anyway, so where was I? We're going to go to the next slide. <laughs> uh, we were about there. I mean, we were taught uh, you, you cut off talking about um, the Fed fund rate going back to 1980 and then all of a sudden you, you cut out there. Oh, yeah. I was talking about uh, how the global economy basically caused rates to come down. Paul Volcker really raised interest rates to kill inflation. So inflation really ran from the Vietnam War all the way through about 1983, um, you know, in a very significant manner. And, uh, you know, he raised rates dramatically and he basically shut the economy down and he killed inflation. And then we got into a global economy. And so rates have gone down progressively over the last 40 years. Uh, now, will we, main, will we uh, maintain that global economy? I hope so. But the Ukraine war is causing some concerns on that issue. Uh, you know, politically, we have some concerns about that. We have the situation in China, which is somewhat uh, disconcerting, um, you know, because they don't want to play by international rules. So we'll see what happens here. But let's hope we keep the global economy. I will tell you this. I have a lot of friends fairly high up in major international companies. They have all been 100% focused on duplicating supply chains, duplicating manufacturing sites, making sure they never get stuck like this again if there's any other sort of event. They will be able to, they won't be. So, uh, shoot, next slide. Okay, there we go. Well, this just shows uh, the 10 year treasury. Now, it's dropped a little bit from here. You can see where it worked up because of the recent inflationary issues. Uh, it was, I think it was at about 3.01 today, roughly. Uh, the one interesting thing to me in mentioning that is that historically, 30 year fixed rate mortgages have run one and a half to two percent above the 10-year t-bill and that relationship has been very very consistent if you take an average the 30-year fixed rate mortgage is 1.68 percent above the t-bill well it's much higher than that now because of uncertainty so if in fact we have nothing changed with ukraine and we have a slow downward trend on inflation because we're having a rebalancing of the supply versus services spending and also an opening up of the supply chain you will see mortgage rates come down. And I'm, I'm, uh, my guess right now is if we do not have anything else uh, upset the apple cart, if you will, you'll see mortgage rates down to about, uh, uh, down to about 4.8 to 5.1% by uh, October or November. Uh, and that will help fairly significantly because they're roughly around 5.8, 5.9 right now. So, um, you know, we'll see you know, just a readjustment and that's without rates coming down. That's just readjusting the 30 year fix to its normal, um, normal relationship to the uh, 10 year T bill. So next slide, please. 
You know, what's, what's really interesting about you saying that about them coming back down, there's one thing that I've been telling buyers over and over and over again, is that even though right now it's not fun to be paying high interest rates, now that prices are loosening up on some of these properties, that it is a good time to jump in and get a property that you love, right? Because you marry the home, you you date the interest rate, uh, but getting in now where you can get it a home with a for, with a price that's affordable that what will happen is between now and October, I've been saying this over and over again, is that you'll start to see inventory. It'll, it'll probably spike up even more in July, but then a lot of it's going to come start coming off the market as people come back in the market as they do late July uh, in this market. And then around October, November timeframe, everybody starts trying to buy again. And then all of a sudden inventory is low and prices start coming back up. So what I'm telling people is like between now and October, especially if rates come down, if rates come down in October, what I'm saying is exactly what's going to happen. All that inventory is going to get clobbered up because people see interest rates come down. Is he still there? Did I lose him? Ugh. Oh. Every sales manager knows. Is, Sounded like me. Yeah. <laughs> uh, did we lose him again? Can you hear me? I can see, yeah, I can see Patty on there. Patty, I'm going to bring you on real quick and see if that if you sound better there and we can have him switch. Hold on one second. Patty on there. Patty, I'm going to bring you on real quick and see if that if you sound better there and we can have him switch. Hold on one second. <laughs> Patty on there. Patty, I'm going to bring oh my you on gosh. real quick. You're, you're watching it on the live stream. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. We're working on it. Hold on one second. Patty on there. Patty, I'm going to bring you on real quick. You're watching it on the live stream. Sorry, everybody. We're working on it. Hold on one second. Kill it. Stop it. I'm trying to. Remember. There we go. All right. Patty. Hi. <laughs> there you are. We can hear you and see you. Do you want to switch and have him sit there? Because then we can actually hear and see him. I can't hear you guys, but. You can't. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Isn't he a dial up? Oh. I can hear him. Oh. We gotta get off now. We're working on it. Okay. Can you hear me? We can hear you. It's doing the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> this is the fun part of doing these things live. If we did it recorded, then you wouldn't get to see all this funness. So welcome, welcome to all the fun. I tried. All right. Have them, have them jump back on the phone. We'll, we'll keep rolling. I think they can hear us, but. There we go. All right. We're back. Hey. I'm okay. sorry. No worries. I don't know what happened. Um, I forget. Forget where we are, but you want, you want to go to the next slide? And... Yep. So this there shows this is pretty interesting because this shows exactly what I was talking about in goods and services, and you can see that with the pandemic, you had disposable income go up dramatically, and household spending went down, and that was uh, basically because of the stimulus. About seven trillion all in in stimulus for the pandemic. And then, uh, of course, people got, you know, immediately because of uh, social distancing and all the uh, precautionary measures, uh, spending went down. Now, disposable income has leveled off and is actually tra uh, tracking a little bit below its trend line. Household spending has gone up, but it will start coming down because we're using up the pandemic, uh, the pandemic uh, excess. Uh, next slide. Uh, there we go. And this, uh, th this is interesting. This shows uh, energy prices in Europe. You can see what's happening to them because of the, pan uh, because of the uh, Ukraine war, uh, the shutdown of the Russian oil supplies. And then the final slide, go ahead. Uh, you know, we, we're upset about inflation, but look at inflation in Russia right now, 17.1%. Uh, so it'll be really interesting to me how long they can maintain this war without having, you know, some pushback because 17% uh, inflation is just, 
it's even it's it's impossible to even comprehend that that's just impossible to live with so all right next slide so talking about you know homes and everybody's talked about the real estate market slowed way down and so forth and so on well yes yeah, down to where it was between 2013 to 2018 now this is the NAR seasonally adjusted annualized rate of uh, monthly sales. And as of May, it was almost right, right exactly where it was from 2015 to 20, uh, right up to the time of the pandemic. So we still have a real estate market. You know, one of the things we have a problem with in this country is a re what I call recency bias. And that is that we focus so much on the latest piece of news and we, we give it disproportionate weight to its importance. So the news has been about how real estate has slowed way down. Well, uh, yeah, it wasn't exactly booming between 2015 to the pandemic. But if you go back historically, it was where it was uh, all the way up until the great, big, the great big boom prior to the Great Recession. So it's not that bad. Uh, next slide. Oh, uh, here you can see the uh, active listings and how they've dropped every every year. Um, you know, one of the things that's that's happened. I'll I'll get to this in a minute about people moving and people uh, trading homes and people the changing locations. That's been declining for a long time, and that impacts this. Also, the pandemics impact this. Um, I got asked the other day, in all sincerity, you know, aren't I worried because? Demand has dropped, and aren't we going to have, aren't we going to have a significant price drop? And I said no, because supply has dropped almost directly in proportion to demand. So the supply-demand balance is what determines pricing, and uh, the supply-demand balance is about where it was before the pandemic started. So it's uh, it's interesting to watch. Next slide. Now, shortfall of existing homes for sale. This is just basically what everybody's heard and knows. And that is that we have underbuilt dramatically. Um, I have seen rational estimates that have been figured very precisely by different people using different methodologies that say that we are short anywhere from 4.8 to 7 million homes from where we should be based on population. And the fact that the millennials are now coming into first time home buyer age and the millennials are the second biggest population bubble after the baby boomers. So we have not been building homes and we are short at least 5 million homes from where we need to be. Next slide. Uh, <laughs> here's your uh, mortgage payments and what's happened because of interest rates. And obviously it's painful. It's gone up pretty dramatically. It says here about 43.4% year over year, four week rolling average. Next slide. And then the uh, the competition or, or price drops, I should say, on listings, and that's the second highest it's been. So we really got into a situation where we had very, very, very strong demand, very low, low time on market. Uh, that is starting to correct a little bit. Next slide. And then this is the uh, competition I, I mistakenly referred to. And we, we are getting uh, we are getting competition. Uh, it is it is coming down, but but it's still it's still fairly significant. Next slide. OK, my favorite all time, uh, uh, my least favorite all time home buyer price index, the Case Shiller index. Uh, just a real quick comment. I mean, I'm going to come across a little caustic and sarcastic here, and I apologize. <laughs> That's fine. <laughs> That's what we do on this channel. We do <laughs> we do that very well. Go ahead. Well, the media uses this index, and it's one of the worst indexes there is. Uh, a really interesting story here. So uh, it used to be called the Case Shiller Weiss Index. A guy named Alan Weiss uh, actually invented the index. Uh, when they sold it to S&P, they dropped Weiss's name. So it's the Case Shiller Index. Alan Weiss is embarrassed about this index. He thinks it's one of the worst things he ever did. Uh, and it really is misleading because it shows home price appreciation going up at 20 percent. And people assume that that is a number that they should use in almost every market. And that's not the case. Next slide. You can see here that the uh, median sales, median existing home price has gone up also. Next slide. 
This shows the median sales price of existing homes May of this year versus May of last year by region. Now look at the difference in both both the in both the cost, the median sales price of a home in each region, but also in the level of appreciation in this, each region. So real quickly to give you some numbers, May to May, May of 21 to May of 22, median sales price in the U.S. went up 14.8%. Median sales price in the Northeast went up 6.75%. Median sales price in the Midwest went up 9.5%. In the South, it went up 20.6%. In the West, it went up 13.3%. So median sales price actually gives you a better indication of the regional differences and also shows that prices don't go up at the same rate in every location like the Case-Shiller Index indicates. Also, I would point out if you break it down by by um, by tiers. So in other words, if you look at each of each market and you will look at each, the top one third, the middle third, the bottom third and the price range, they go up at different rates in different markets. Um, interestingly enough, Austin, Texas and Texas as a whole is one of the few markets in which all three tiers have moved up at pretty much the same rate. Uh, if you go to the market I live in, the top tier went up dramatically. The bottom tier went up at about about 20% the rate of the top tier. So uh, the case Shiller index doesn't so really can tell you, us anything. Can you explain that for Austin real quick? So all three levels, so you're talking about levels of income went up? No, levels of pricing. Levels if of pricing the, based if, on the income. No, not on income. Price, okay, of the based on there. price of the home. If you broke the prices down into three tiers, okay. the top mm. tier, middle tier, and the bottom tier. All three tiers have appreciated at the same rate in Austin. And what that tells you is that it's a well-balanced growing economy and in, in, in with, with job growth at every level and with a, a high, un, a very low unemployment rate. So, so it's a very, very strong and positive indicator. What, what's an example of the tiers, the three tiers? So, uh, well, so, so if, if you say prices between... What's what's the top? Uh, let's say let's say a million is on average the top, and the bottom is three hundred thousand. So the bottom tier would be three, be three hundred to uh, to uh, I'm having a hard time about five fifty. Middle tier would be five fifty to about seven fifty. The top tier would be seven fifty to a million. Gotcha. And so all three segments are going up at the same rate. That means that people at different eco income levels are all doing really well and they're all participating in the market in re relatively the same manner. You go to the market I live in, the high end has gone up like a rocket ship. The low end hasn't. See, what's, what's interesting about that number is it doesn't account for any, I'll say, institutional or otherwise investors that are, because no. this is just home sales, right? Just home sales. Yep. Yep. What I, what I love about what you just said is that, you know, up until really 2019, I was helping a lot of clients primarily in that 350 and under price point. That's primarily where I was helping a lot of clients. Now it's totally different. I mean, we have a team, I have a team and we, we help all price points. So we do a lot of luxury. We do a lot of different stuff. But what's interesting is that all of those clients that, that I was helping buy homes like 16, 17 through 19, when we're selling their homes right now and they're moving up, like, yeah, it's more expensive, but they've made a big chunk of money selling their home to then go up. So that's partly why you probably have seen two um, people's, you know, disposable incomes go up because they're selling homes at a much higher value. Now they have disposable income as well. Yeah. That, yeah. That, it kind of depends on where you're, where you are, but yeah, I think that is, an, that has some influence. So next slide. Oh, sorry. So this just shows you the fact that people have moved less and less. Uh, it's really interesting to me because, you know, we got really fixated on the amount of movement occurring between because of the pandemic. And there was a sudden surge of movement. It's dying off already. But if you look going back to 1985, the amount of people moving has gone down dramatically. And then moving within the same county has also gone down. Next slide. And these, these next two slides sort of illustrate this uh, even more clearly. You can see the percentage of people non- Oh, we lost them again. 
Oh, come back. Yeah, I think um, to at California's point that the investor comment is a big deal. So th that was the first thing that popped into my mind. I'm like, if we don't account for investors or we don't, this guy has facts, all facts. Yeah, if we don't count account for investors, that's a big deal. Yeah, you know. Um, and move up buyers, like you said. What, I, oh man, I found this article that came out and it was talking about all the institutional buyers that bought in the last, uh, since the pandemic, it was like, uh, in, in Texas, it was like 38% or something. It was really, really, really high. Really for high. It, it was that, yeah. am I right? And it was like 38, it was, it was definitely over 20% because we'd been looking at numbers for a while saying 20%. But here's one thing that, that I think that, cause I went through and I was going to do a whole video on it. The one thing that I broke down in there, it said a lot of in, institutional buyers were buying and it was, you know, it had a lot. The one thing I think it did not have in it was the fact that you had a lot of these I buyers because the way they justified uh, or, or the way they clarified as an institutional investor was somebody that was buying basically with an LLC or cash. And I think it wasn't putting into in, in or really accounting for the fact that you had a lot of like I buyers buying, buying cash and then putting them back on the market. So if you're looking at it that way, though a lot of, yeah, of course there's a lot of people buying and basically flipping as institutional investors and they're buying property. So, um, interesting note, sorry, Pat, you're back. Um, so you were talking about movement from 2000 to two, uh, 2021. Okay. Well, I just pointing out that, uh, you know, we've had a fairly significant trend in place for quite a while about people not moving as much. Uh, and, uh, you know, kind of runs counter to the perception the media has about the impact of the pandemic. Yes, there has been some relocations, but it's already started to uh, slow down on that level also. So next slide. Next slide. All right. The same thing, renters versus movers. And uh, I probably talked about that enough. Let's go ahead. Next slide. And, you know, this is uh, uh, working from home, basically. Uh, now, this, this, this one kind of bothered me a little bit, um, and that is because what it doesn't show is the fact that a lot of companies, in fact, I would say to you, the majority of companies are allowing employees to have to work from home on Fridays or Mondays or come into the office three or four days a week. So while this shows, uh, you know, basically working from home going way down, the reality is we've had a little bit of a change in lifestyle and people are tending to have uh, more time at home and more flexibility. And productivity has actually gone up. And a lot of people attribute the productivity going up because there's less time commuting and uh, people will work uh, on a non-traditional non eight to five hours. They'll work in the evening, they'll work in the weekend, they'll do other things. And I think I, I, would, I would attest to that. I mean, it's just, we don't have that rigid timeline we used to have and we're more flexible. So we'll see where it ends up, but I think we've created a, a good environment. So I want to talk a little bit real quickly about um, the perception that we may have a housing crash and people talk about the Great Recession. I saw a stupid article today, not that I have an opinion about it, but I saw a stupid article today <laughs> that's saying that we're very akin to where we were during the Great Recession. Not at all. The slide that you just brought up that shows um, it shows foreclosures and it shows bankruptcies. And you can see that both had trended down dramatically since the Great Recession. And then you can see the forbearance that occurred with the pandemic, basically shutting uh, foreclosures down altogether. Next slide. So here's why. Look at FICO scores, especially in the last five or six years. In the last five or six years, two thirds of all mortgages have had FICO scores over 760. Look where it was prior to the Great Recession. We were running 20 to 25 percent, basically subprime loans. So the quality of the mortgages outstanding now are just phenomenally high. In fact, uh, 51 million, I think it's 51 million homes, uh, excuse me, 53.5 million first mortgages outstanding with an average FICO of 751. So we are in solid shape in terms of people that own homes. Next slide. Here you have another representation that gives you some indication of what happened with a great recession. You see product risk and borrower risk. 
And that product risk in dark blue, that's subprime loans, that's stated income loans, that's garbage. That's uh, you, if you could walk and talk, you could get a mortgage. And um, you know, whether you could pay it or not was irrelevant going into the, going into the Great Recession. Unfortunately, it, I don't think we ever clearly let the public understand what happened. What happened was that Wall Street securitized mortgages and they would do so in such a way that they would add subprime loans uh, to a securitization in order to get the return rate up. Well, when we had the financial meltdown, it just killed it. It killed it. It killed subprime. It killed securitized mortgages. And basically, we haven't had a secondary market uh, of securitization for mortgages since the Great Recession. Basically, the GSEs bought them or you, you basically you couldn't sell them. So the next slide. Um, I'm having a hard time. looking. Oh, that's getting into talking about issues, going back on the recession real quick or going back on the uh, potential downturn. I did a fairly comprehensive study on how much of the market I thought was susceptible to foreclosure should there be a real harsh economic shock. In other words, a, a, a recession and a prolonged period of pain, how much would we see in terms of foreclosures? Worst case scenario, in my opinion, is 350,000 foreclosures. That compares to three and a half million in two years during the Great Recession. So worst case scenario in this, where we are right now, is maybe 10% of what we saw during the Great Recession. So we do not, we're not going to have a housing market crash. We're not going to have a plunge in, in valuations. We're not going to have a big problem like we had before. It's just not going to happen. So uh, we, we got a lot of slides to go here. If, if I go off of this, I know a lot of people want to get to questions about the market in general. Um, you know, to, to the point, you know, a lot of people are really worried right now. Um, a lot of people are anticipating a crash. Uh, I mean, that's what a lot of that's, I mean, obviously it's what you keep hearing in the news. Obviously we're um, in a scenario where we're looking at a recession potentially Overall, what are your expectations between now and the end of the year in the housing market? Maybe if you want to talk about Austin or just the market in general, because Austin's definitely seeing where we went from the beginning of the year, about 1,800. I mean, I remember me and Ian were sitting here going 1,800 homes on the market. This is stupid. How is this even working? Uh, and now we're at about 8,000, 7,900 is what I saw today. So what is your overall like? just overall assessment of what's going to happen here in the future based on a lot of the stats that you've looked and showed us here. Well, um, nationally, um, I, I do think that mortgage rates are going to, I think inflation is going to ease down a little bit. I think mortgage rates are going to ease down a little bit. I think the market's going to probably uh, continue to cool gradually, but not dramatically. Uh, and I don't see any crash of any sort uh, at all. Now, we have some markets where we've had really high appreciation, and the con I think they will level off. I, I think that demand will slow down, so consequently prices will slow down. But I don't see any crash at all. I don't. And, um, you know, I think we, uh, I think, you know, it goes back to one of the reasons I showed that slide on moving and I showed the slide on FICO scores and how healthy the market is. Uh, if you don't have to sell, do you sell? No. I mean, you don't sell at a discount or you or you, you know, crashes are caused by foreclosures and people having to dump houses or people not being able to afford to make their payments. I, I don't see any of that happening unless we went into a dramatic uh, recession. I mean, uh, you know, something that's off the charts. You look at our economy right now. American businesses have more capital than they've ever had, ever, ever, ever. They are better capitalized right now than they have ever been. Uh, and that is because they had significant time with very low interest rates. A lot of them floated uh, more stock or borrowed money, floated bonds. So American businesses are in position A. American consumers in very good shape. I showed you the slides earlier on the American consumer, the percentage of their take home pay that they were using for debt and their income. So basically, our economy is, uh, in terms of both businesses and consumers, in very, very good shape. Will we see a recession? I would probably bet that sometime next year we'll have a short, uh, modest recession. And that is because the global economy is slowing down. And as I said earlier, we're a global economy. 
So we will have some issues with that. I don't see a real problem and I don't see a crash in the housing market. I do see prices leveling off. I see prices leveling off fairly fairly soon and and staying fairly flat for a while, the three to five percent range. So, I mean, if, if you're looking at the comments in the chat, I mean, a lot of people are saying uh, this guy's famous last words. I don't see a crash. The uh, we're in a dramatic recession, Mr. Stone. <laughs> uh, uh, there uh, what was the other one I saw here. Uh, thank well, you you, would you please let me say a comment real quick? You want yeah, a dramatic please, well, recession? Go, go I, back to the 1980s. That yeah. was a dramatic recession. And if you live through that, then you know what a really what a, what a dramatic recession is. Uh, the Great Recession in 2010 was was uh, was significant and it was painful, but we got through it. And that was built. We were living in a house of cards then. Right. We are not in a house of cards right now. We are in a very strong financial situation. The global economy could create a problem for us. I mean, if the Ukraine war goes on or escalates, that's a problem. If it doesn't or if it just winds down, then I think we will recover. So how much impact does higher rates have uh, to discouraging uh, sellers selling? And is it a factor to keep home prices stable? Well, uh, the, historically, there's been very little correlation between rates and prices. Um, you know, but it does what it does impact is the the amount of transactions. So the, the uh, if rates go up, then transactions slow down. And, uh, you know, I, I don't, I'm not overly worried about that. You know, if you really look historically, our rates are still not that high. I mean, people are talking about rates are really high. I mean, I, my first home I bought at the current rate back in the early seventies. So, I mean, this is, this is historically, this isn't that high. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, as you're talking, a lot of people seem really concerned with what's happening just in the market. Right. I think yeah. the media is feeding a lot of panic, right? Um, you have a lot of people just out there basic. I mean, you have full YouTube channels out there basically just saying the market's going to crash. Um, so smart think has a comment here it says 8% in, uh, inflation, car market crashing, uh, gas prices soaring and going much higher. I think a lot of people are worried about a lot of these things. And so they're automatically, assuming that we're going to see something really negative happen. What would you say to maybe ease people's minds that are so worried and worked up about what's happening in the market? Well, I don't think that, uh, I don't think gas prices will go up from here. Um, uh, the car market hasn't crashed. I mean, you can't even, you still can't even buy a car and you, you buy one and you get what you get, right? Because the demand still exceeds the supply. So it hasn't crashed. It's gotten difficult, right? So um, I think things will, I don't think things can get much tighter in terms of supply and demand. And I don't see, I don't see, unless there is some other event occurs, uh, things will get better from here. Um, I mean, I, you know, one of the, and I get so frustrated because one of the things that's happened, can, can I get a little bit off track here for a second? Sure, please. All right. So we used to have the Fairness Act in this country. And the Fairness Act required all media sources to report all sides of every issue and to state when there is state when they are voicing an opinion, they had to say, and this is an opinion. We got rid of that in 1987. So consequently, what you have now is the media competing with each other to get your attention. Now, how do they do that? By scaring you, by beating the drum on everything that's going to hell in a handbasket. Uh, the reality is, if you take the time and effort to look at things, Yes, it's concerning. It's it's disconcerting because there is so many so much uncertainty and so many things that we don't know could happen. But if you look at the underlying financial health of this country, it is still very good. Corporations have a lot of money. People still have, on on a whole, judging the whole society, have money and are not too far in debt. Will housing prices continue to go up at this rate? No, they will not. They will level off. Supply and demand have both declined, so I don't see that I don't see a lot of supply coming on the market with low demand, which would cause prices to come down, and I don't see foreclosures, which would cause a causing crash. So I'm not quite sure what would cause it, to be honest with you. 
Yeah, I mean, I think what what we're seeing here is just a lot of uh, frustration with people over yeah. the last couple of years, right? Prices on homes went dramatically high and now we're running into where rates are high and then you have everyone saying, well, it's not going to crash while you have a segment of people saying, oh, it's going to crash. So you have a lot of people getting very spirited right now. The comments are getting super spirited. And I think it's just a lot of what we're hearing is just people getting really scared. Yes, yep. uh, we can say prices have gone up, but even uh, Hesco Bandit here just says gas prices have actually gone down. What's interesting, I went to go get gas the other day. I don't buy gas because I have a Tesla. Uh, I sound like a jerk when I say that. But I finally had to go fill up. Uh, we're moving in the middle of moving, so we're borrowing a truck, which was a truck I sold <laughs> my father-in-law. And I'm like, wow, gas prices aren't as high as I thought they were because we're in Texas, please. And I'm like, that's only four fifty a gallon. Now, when I fill up my other car, it's way more expensive. So I was just shocked that gas was actually not as high as I thought it was. But I don't buy gas either, so I sound like a prick probably for that. Well, uh, 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 some of us older people on the show will remember waiting in lines to get gas back in 1974, 75, 76, late 70s. I mean, it just got crazy. Were the gas prices as high as they are now? No, but compared to income, yes, they were. And you had to wait for a half hour to get fill up your tank with gas. So, I mean, we've been through ups and downs and ups and downs. Uh, again, to me, the one uncertainty here that has the biggest influence on all of this is the Ukraine war. The Ukraine war stopped tomorrow. You would see rates coming down fairly noticeably. And you would think you would see a lot of anxiety abating fairly quickly because you would have access to gas and there would be food, there would be plenty of food. You know, if you really want to ask me what I worry about, I worry about global hunger because I think we could have a huge problem if the Ukraine war goes on very long, especially in Africa. I mean, we're going to have a lot of very, very, very hungry people. Um, you know, our, our, our economy is based on the global economy. And so if the Ukraine war goes on for another couple of years, uh, it could get pretty bad. I mean, it could it, then I would be getting a little bit more negative. Uh, uh, Carlos says here, based on the current situation, do you think it is time to buy or to rent for one year until the market gets softer? Are, are, are you asking me? Yeah. 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 Oh, um, you know, I, I think it depends on your financial, financial situation. I don't know that I think that the price is going to come down. I don't think they'll go up as fast as they've been going by any stretch of the imagination. And, and I think maybe next year at this time will be 5% higher. If you find a home you like and you can buy it, buy it and you can refi down the road, rates come back down. You, um, you know, one thing I find interesting is that all the people that are complaining about uh, the prices of rent going up. Well, this is the thing. Every, if everybody's going and saying, Hey, I'm not going to buy. Right. So we're seeing more inventory, but they go out and rent instead. That means there's more demand for rent, which doesn't that mean that rental rates are going to continue to rise? Rental rates are going through the roof and that's scary. Yeah. I would agree. And we have a shortage of homes. We got all these people you know, so people coming into uh, first time buyer age, there's a correlation to that. And that's called household formation. Household formation is accelerating dramatically now because millennials are moving out of their parents' home. The millennials are moving out on their own. So the demand for uh, households, be it a single family residence or a or an apartment going up strong. So I don't you know, I it's I don't think it's going to get it's going to go the other way anytime soon. Ian, what are your thoughts, man? And I've got a lot of questions. I think one, oh, of, the questions, one of the questions I would ask is, um, and this is for you, Mr. Stone, what would you say is a good way to track, and this is kind of on topic, what would you say is a good way to track the migratory patterns of people? So not just people moving from California to Austin like it has been, but is are you is are those part of your numbers when you're looking at the economics of things um, related to real estate at all? Well, we didn't get to the part of the slideshow where I showed the number of uh, you know Fortune 500 companies in Texas or the amount of companies and people that have moved from California. So the underlying economics really have to do with job creation. And basically, that is uh, either a new company forming or a company relocating. 
Obviously, Texas has benefited tremendously from the amount of relocation of corporations and people, um, you know, from uh, from California and other places. I would hearken back to the slides I showed you about people moving. People move, uh, they're getting so they move more and more for economic reasons, and, and they may have a second, uh, you know, a vacation home or something, but they don't typically, they don't typically move, just randomly move. They have to have an economic reason for it. So um, I think you've seen a tremendous surge into, uh, into Texas. I think it's probably peaked already, but, but I don't think it's, uh, I mean, I think it's, Texas is in a very good situation and will have job growth for a while. So that's a good thing. So uh, next question is, uh, Lennar Homes just released their uh, financial outlook. And apparently... As the second largest home builder, they're not they're not doing so well, and so, sorry, you hear the motorcycle. Uh, they have a decrease in number of building permits. They're adding all sorts of incentives. So Lennar, second largest home builder, seems a little worried. How do you feel? Well, what do you think about that? I think that's all. That applies to all home builders. If you go back, if you go back pre-pandemic, and even uh, pre-pandemic, the home, national home builders were gearing up to finally come back to the market with a, a tremendous amount of new construction. They were doing that. They had been on the sidelines uh, for most of the last 10 years since the Great Recession. Uh, then the pandemic happened and they got all got kind of uh, cautious. Then they started getting excited again in 2021. And we saw... Uh, from about April of 2021 through the end of 2021, saw probably more subdivisions recorded and building permits and everything else happening. And then the, then the Ukraine war happened. So we've had uh, kind of two false starts here recently where builders have been getting excited. Uh, builder optimism was up. Uh, the amount of new, uh, uh, new subdivisions was up dramatically. And then you run into a problem. So um, you know, unfortunately for builders, it takes a long time to construct a home. But even more importantly, right now, they don't have control over their costs like they used to. And Lennar and a lot of other companies, because of increased costs in lumber, concrete and everything else, it's hard to it's hard to make a profit because you you. You, you uh, sit down and you figure out, OK, I could develop this land and the cost of the lots of this and then I build it. And this all now it's taken two or three times longer to build it. And your cost of building is 30 or 40 percent higher than you thought. So, yeah, I mean, it's really difficult right now for home builders. And the fact they're having a hard time has to do with the cost of supplies and the timing. Well, that was I mean, the biggest thing that we've seen, you know, uh, I, uh, it's funny, Ian, I, I just read that article today. Um, and the biggest, my biggest takeaway on all of that was the fact that they had like three categories of like where their homes were being built and what, uh, what they were seeing in those three categories. Um, there was one, which is everything was still great Two, which is like, Hey, things are starting to get really shaky in these markets. And then three, uh, we're seeing deep price cuts and all this stuff. What I found interesting, and I think, you know, if you're looking at Lennar, I chuckle. Um, I have a video coming out next week about builders, and I talk about Lennar specifically quite a bit. But what's interesting is Lennar for the last two years has done everything they can to disincentivize people uh, from using realtors and bringing realtors. So you are disincentivizing agents from bringing you business. Now agents are saying, screw you. We have inventory out there. We're going to take our clients in business to a builder who actually will take care of our client, who will actually build a home quality wise and not screw over my client and me as well. And so if you're looking at that and Lennar's like, oh, whatever, you know, no big deal. Austin numbers are way down. Well, now that we have inventory, agents are like, yeah, I'd rather go take my client to a Gian for the same price. I'd rather take my client to a pay setter for the same price. Somewhere like that, which I find hysterical because they're like, oh, no big deal. Yet they're still actively disincentivizing agents from bringing their business, bringing them business. I think it's the dumbest thing they could have ever done was try to really like, oh, we don't want to work with agents anymore because we don't want to pay for them. There you go. 
Yeah. And the, you know, the, the inability to uh, project a profit because you can't control the cost of your materials and they're, rad- and they're changing, the cost is changing so radically. Uh, it makes it really, really difficult. Even if you like agents, it's tough to be a builder right now. It's really tough. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that's the thing, you know, here's, a, here's the tough part, right? So I'm in the middle of closing an investment property. We signed, we finally signed on everything today and we went to our final walk and it was not ready. And they're still having issues like getting uh, labor to build homes. So we're seeing a lot of this inventory that's hitting the market. But I think what people really need to realize about a lot of the new build inventories, it's still not fully built yet. So uh, a lot of these builders are now putting their inventory in the market three months or two months before it's actually complete. So even at that rate, you're still not going to be able to move into that home for another couple months, right? Or you still can't close for another couple of months. So what buyers are doing is going, well, shoot, I don't know where interest rates are going to be in two months from now. So instead, I'm going to go buy a resale home. But even at that rate, I think a lot of people are out of town and on vacation and doing what they would do in a year where really the pandemic is not a big deal this year. If you think about that, now I just got demonetized. But um, this year, no, people are doing fun things. Everybody I see on Instagrams out at the lake, right, Ian? So I think uh, that's actually a really interesting point. The The discretionary money that people had during the pandemic because they couldn't go anywhere and spend money, I think increased the amount of people that were able to try and purchase or investors that had extra money to purchase real estate. And I know a lot of people ended up paying more than the appraised value for it, but I think that was part of what fueled it because sitting at home bored, like I need more space. I've got extra money. Let's go ahead and uh, put it into real estate. There's probably some of that for sure. Do you, uh, this is a, a Siri has this question, uh, Siri, I, so I love it. Um, is it a good time to sell the current house you are in and trade up to a bigger one? That depends on the individual, your income and what you need. You know, I mean, you know, the thing about buying homes and everybody on the call knows this buying homes, it, it, there's a multiple multitude of reasons to want to buy a home. There's a multitude of reasons that you need a home. And there's a lot of factors that go in when you should do it. So this is, I, I hate, you know, anybody that offers, hey, this is a good time to do this or this is a good time to do that. It depends on the individual and it depends on their own, their financial condition. So. Um, I, I agree. You know, you know, I have clients that are doing the move up right now, right? I think too, what we're seeing, why we're seeing so much inventory is a lot of people So there's two things, I think a lot of people that would have, so for the longest time to build a home only took about eight to 10 months, right? You know, depending on the price point and how big eight to 10 months, maybe a year, a lot of builders, especially like the build that I closed today, it's, it took 16 or 17 months to build. So what you're seeing is a lot of this inventory that should have been here in January when these homes would have, should have been closing in January and didn't all this inventory from these move up buyers is now hitting the market. I have a listing where their their home just lit, uh, finally closed or they moved out and it's sitting here as a vacant listing. So I think a lot of those people that um, should have closed earlier in the year and a lot of this inventory that would have been uh, earlier um, would have come out earlier and would have kept our prices in Austin. What are we at right now? 665 or something like that, Ian? It'll definitely be like probably 630 uh, for, the, for the June numbers. But um, I think a lot of that would have slowed that whole real big spike down quite a bit. How we'd had a lot of this inventory earlier. You know, there's, there's a lot of disruption to the normal economic cycle, starting with the pandemic exacerbated by the Ukraine war. Um, you know, if you really, you know, again, and I promise not to get political, but if you wanted to, if you really wanted to know when it started to worry me is when we started putting tariffs in place, tariffs have never worked. Right. And we put tariffs on Canadian lumber and that that's that started the construction cost issue. Uh, it's just uh, too many variables there. I, you know, I encourage everybody to think independently, think about your own situation, think about what you can or can't do, or what you should do. Uh, don't don't pay any attention to the media. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> I don't trust me. 
uh, especially people that tell me that Treviso is a good neighbor to buy in. <laughs> That's actually a really good point, um, Patrick. If you can share what you would feel is a credible source for some information, I think that would be helpful for people. Well, you know what I do, and and uh, people laugh at me, but I subscribe to the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times. And I read both every morning. I read the Financial Times. I read the Economist uh, magazine, which is uh, which is tremendous. That's, you know, and so those are my main sources. I go online. I mean, I follow the market. I used to be a stockbroker before I got into real estate. So um, I look at a lot of different things. But I look at both the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times over coffee in the morning. And I have to laugh because sometimes I don't recognize articles are about the same thing. Because <laughs> look, but it, but it also keeps me really aware of the fact that you can look at things from a lot of different angles, and it really serves you well to get lots of sources of information, so that you're not just being told or re, or having your biases or your misinformation reaffirmed by somebody. So I I encourage you: The Economist magazine, Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, New York Times. Awesome. Well, I, I know you got to get out of here soon, so we'll let you jump off. And uh, I really, I, I mean, I, I can't thank you enough for uh, jumping on and going through your slides. Um, if, if people want to reach out to you and find more information, what's the best way to do that? Um, uh, you, you can email me at pstone at willistonfinancial.com, and I will try to respond to that. Uh, we have offices there in Austin, and they can, uh, WFG, and you can... Uh, contact them but i'm happy to respond to anybody that contacts me awesome so what so uh wfg uh title where um i think there's 11 locations where where are you at right now well we're in uh we're national we're in 50 states we're one of six companies that's national okay. and uh so we uh we have about 2,000 uh, independent title companies that write our policies because we're an insurance underwriter and then we own uh, about 135 offices in the western part of the United States. Wow, that's awesome. Well, again, thank you so much for joining us. We'll let you get out of here. Uh, Meredith's telling me that you got to go. So um, I'll thank let you, you, you go. I really appreciate the time. Well, thank you for having me. Sorry about the technological difficulties. And uh, I, I like your show. And best of luck to both of you. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you. Take All care. right. Bye. Bye. Ian, what are your takeaways from from some of the stuff that um, that we're on here? I numbers are tough. Yeah, <laughs> I still i I liked your comment about the oil. I, I'll bring that back up again. Uh, I think it does have uh, there there would be an impact to that. I think the war. The problem I have with the war in Ukraine is that it still doesn't answer anything. Right. Right. It's mm -hmm. always if it ends. And I'm not saying I don't want it to end. I'm saying, well, what does that mean until then? Right. Right. In, in his uh, in his scenario. So I do feel like uh, there was some news about interest rates uh, being dropped again. So that's kind of interesting. But, yeah. you know, you hear you hear this stuff all the time. We hear it all the time. And we look at NAR. We look at we look at uh, Zillow, Redfin every site out there. We look at NAR, we look at ABOR Realtors and everybody is guessing. That's all. <laughs> I think yeah. there's, there's so many people that well, are just what's, guessing I mean, on think about based it. on what they think they know from before. Well, yeah, especially if you, if you look at, um, at the beginning of the year, remember we were looking at Zillow, Redfin, all of them having these like economic forecasts and everything was like crazy high. And I'm like, well, it makes sense that everything is going to go up, but this, and we were saying at the beginning of the year, like there's not, there's nothing on the market. And I think, I think, I think the biggest issues that we saw why things were so fast at the beginning of the year is because number one, all this talk about interest rates going up, which they did, and they did way more than we thought they would. That was a big issue. So I think a lot of people were just trying to buy as much as they could then. The second thing, and I really do think this is a problem, is that all of these builds that were supposed to be done, think about it. If you went in and you put a contract on a new build and they still had three homes that they were building inventory, which homes do you think that they were building first? Yours or the inventory homes? Oh, absolutely the inventory. Yeah, so... 
just like my home that was under contract, it took forever to close. And we finally closed today. But geez, walking through this thing today, I'm like, this is this is a joke, right? You guys are serious. Like you want me to well, sign closing this? And it's a joke. That's actually a really interesting point. Um, so I had a closing today and it wasn't done. And the builders, they're completely unapologetic. And worse, not only wasn't was it not done, they didn't mention that they didn't have the final inspection until after the closing. They waited until after the closing and said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't have your keys. We never got the inspection. Done. They're just pushing, pushing. They're like, we need to close as fast as we can, everybody that we can, because we're in serious trouble. We shot ourselves in the foot because all these people that we had under contract and we were delaying and delaying and delaying, and now they, a lot of them can't afford what they assumed they would be paying earlier on, especially 17 months in. Oh, you're back. You jumped out of there for a second. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think what was interesting to me in his talk was how much the Ukraine war was actually impacting things. I think that's one thing that I, you know, I keep hearing everybody say that the Ukraine war is impacting things. And I kind of take that with a grain of salt, right? I think a lot of the issues have been not like disincentivizing oil producers from producing oil, telling everybody we're going to get rid of uh, fossil fuel burning vehicles and all this. So I think if you're doing that and you're disincentivizing um, producers, that's going to have an impact on inflation and an impact like even uh, Elon a long time ago was saying, hey, we need to increase production. The guy who's building all the electric cars that people are buying, right, is telling people we still need to produce gas is or uh, oil because it's going to impact everything, like what we eat, uh, what we get, what we buy, like all of these things. So I think this is really interesting. And I think all of this is a big culmination. I mean, a lot of people got pretty angry and heated on here and had some great, uh, some very interesting comments. But I think at the end of the day, everybody needs to take a deep breath and relax because look, things are still moving. They're not perfect. But I think, I mean, and I'm not talking about buying a home. I'm just saying everybody needs to take a deep breath and relax. You know, I almost want to poll the audience here and see how many people here own a home versus rent. It doesn't matter if you own multiple, but like just own a home because there's so many people that I see talking about, oh, I, I want to buy a home. I want to buy a home. I'm just curious what the what the percentage of audience is. Yeah. Drop a comment below. Are you renting or buying if you if you own so like some caveats to that question, right? If you rent or own, I also want to know like if you are owning, are you thinking about selling or are you scared to sell because of the market? Um, also, if you're renting, are you thinking about buying, but you're too scared because of whatever? I mean, you tell me what you're, what you're worried about. Um, if you're waiting to buy for prices to come down, I want to hear that too, because I think a lot of people, what I hear is that, oh, I'm waiting for prices to come down. He's saying the interest rates will drop down back into the 4% range, um, high fours by October. Here's what, if he's right there, if he is right, all of those people that have been waiting by the time October rolls around are going to find themselves back in a multiple offer situation. That's what I'm, if that's going to happen, I'm not saying that I'm not saying run out and buy a home, please. Everybody gets so mad at me. Oh, you're a realtor. You just want people to buy homes. No, I have the same questions you do, right? I buy and sell real estate personally. I want to know what's happening in the market. It's why we bring on these guests, even though you're giving them a hard time. I'm bringing on guests that know more or have been in sectors longer than I have. So I want to hear from you in the comments. Ian, what do you got? Something that uh, I was watching a video on the on 3G on the internet, um, and there was <laughs> a comment that said "owners equivalent rent," and I've never heard it said quite that way. So that term means, you know, people that are buy they have their primary home, but then they buy an investment home or they own an investment property, and they're just trying to make sure that the rent for the person that's in the house is covering their mortgage. And so there are a lot of people that are in that situation uh, that bought maybe a primary residence and then uh, their first investment and they don't understand the property taxes or some of the other 
price fluctuations that can happen when you're owning a house. And so I think that is something that's going to impact not just Austin, but everywhere across the, the nation. And it hasn't really hit yet. I mean, it hit a little bit when we had our 43% tax hike, but I think there's still more, more to that. Yeah. My biggest issue, uh, and if you want me to do a full breakdown video on this, Ian, I think this would be a good video for you to do too, is with prices coming down right now. So the way our tax system works right now, and it went up 56% is what the average, but um, if you look at over a year of time, the, the way the tax system works is supposed to be um, for 2022, what's the value of your home? Right. So we saw a peak in, in May. And I think that's where the peak will end June. I think the numbers are absolutely hundred percent coming down, but when you're protesting your valuations, you're protesting them in the height of the market. You're not protesting your valuations in August, September, when prices come down annually, I've showed this on the channel. People are so like, Oh my God, prices came down. The market's crashing. I'm like, it happens every year, this time of year, chill out. Uh, and then reventure goes out there like, see, I told you the market's crashing. Like, Hey, idiot. If you're a data guy, you would understand what happens in a normal market. Come on. Like you're scaring people. But with the taxes, if they do come down in August, why are we not able to protest our valuations in August since we don't pay our taxes until the end of the year? They're paid in errands. So you don't pay 2022 tax to the end of the year, but your valuation comes out in the heat in the highest part of the market. And that's when they want you to protest your valuation. You want to hear a really crazy thing, Ian? All right. For all of you on this channel, I have not really talked about this publicly on the channel, but this is something that all of you should be paying attention to if you purchased a home this year. So you remember how with the property tax valuations, what they decided to do was give you more like, you know, they increased it, right? So it was like 20% or whatever that you could go up to. Well, uh, that was, and you could homestead in the same year you purchased. Yeah. You want to know what the tax districts are doing for their workaround? What? Spit it out. Nobody's nobody knows this. I heard this from my title rep. They are not showing the home sold until 2023. Shut they are not changing. Oh, wait. They, they are not changing title. So if you bought a home in June, right? So I bought the home from Ian. They're not taking Ian's name off of title until 2023. So you the person that bought the home cannot homestead that same year. Even though they told you, you can homestead apply that for year. it. You can apply for it because they're going to say you haven't, you don't own it because tax district doesn't show that you purchased the home in 2022, but there they're going to show her. There was a small disclaimer there that said it won't go into effect the same year or the year. Yeah. after. So so that is one thing that no one is talking about. And it's something that I wanted to dig into a little bit further before I did a full video on it. But yeah, my title reps like, Hey, they are not Travis County, Hayes County. They're not posting those are changing those. They're saying, Oh, we don't have enough people to do that. That's bullshit. Let's be honest. That's bullshit. So what are I want to answer uh, Carlos's question. It was at eight twenty nine. He asked about the inspection. So what happened for this house that I closed on today is the, the buyer or the builder had a city inspection. They failed it and the inspector needed to come back out. And for some reason, yeah, we had this happen out. today too on yeah. my property. And the inspector didn't come back out because the builders, they think all I care about, not all of them, but mostly what I care about is closing before the end of the month so that my taxes look good. Like my numbers look good. And so they want to close and they'll do whatever they can to make people close. And then in this situation, they hadn't even had their inspection. I don't even know. If, I would assume, I, I don't even know if we have a certificate of occupancy, but they couldn't give the keys until the inspection is complete. The city inspection. Yeah. Cause you had to get the CO was it COE city of occupancies certificate of uh, COO, whatever they call that. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's what happened with us. And our lender's like, oh, well, we can clo close without it. Thankfully, they came back out same day and did it. But yeah, they were going to try to close this without the COO. Yeah, I've got a property in uh, a listing in Round Rock. And 
super low tax rate, uh, excellent price. I've fished it out to investors and they're like, nah. <laughs> I'm like, wait, what? This is a perfect buy and hold. And they're all, nah, doesn't make any sense to me. Yeah. So that's interesting. That's another thing that's been a little off as of late. That's that's not fun, man. Uh, property taxes are more than my mortgage. Yes, 100%. I am purchasing a home right now. Well, we just purchased a home. Uh, do you guys want to know where I moved to? Should I just do that on the live stream? Just like, hey, for the 76 people that are watching right now, here's what happened. Um, instead of doing a full video on it. But um, yeah, uh, one, because we moved a lot of the cash over from the house that we just purchased, our mortgage is like half the cost of what the taxes are per month. The taxes are insane. Yeah. Nah, you ain't getting us. <laughs> He's going to end it. He's going to end it. Uh, Ian's in Round Rock. Uh, now, I feel like just getting after it and telling people where I moved. In 2008, uh, the WAC real estate valuations were a catalyst in the market. In this case, high PE stocks with a, uh, with a catalyst of high inflation, Fed uh, intervention, war that caused the market to drop. Yeah, I mean, 100%. Um, I mean, overall... I think what we're going to see is kind of what he said. I think we're going to see prices drop. I think we'll get back under 500 in the Austin market. We'll probably get back under, sorry, back under 600 in the Austin market. We'll get probably get back under 500 in the MSA. So probably like we'll end the year probably around, because we're at 550 for MSA. So may, maybe it'll be 510, 505, right at five. And then probably like 590 for Austin. What are your thoughts? So, yeah, that's a, it's a modest, it's a modest decline. So yeah, I, I think I agree with that. It doesn't, I don't think it's going to uh, fall sharply for a lot of reasons. Um, and I've, we've talked about them a, a ton. I just, here's, here's what I worry about. You ready for this? You ready for this? I worry that if anything happens, like physically happens to Elon Musk, it may be a huge impact on our market, at least initially, at least for the, and that's a weird thing to think about, but I really think that that matters here. Like the manufacturing, the, we've got um, Boring Company and SpaceX. SpaceX just announced their announced, opening yeah. Bass Drop. Bass Drop. Right. So Boring Company, uh, there's just, there's so much. Tesla influence in the area. Well, not that even has... that. You, you know what's crazy? You know, everybody's saying, oh, you know, uh, you know, Apple and everybody's laying off. Do you know how many emails I get a week from people emailing me say, hey, I'm moving from Toronto or I'm moving from here or there and I want to buy and I'm I'm moving because of Apple? I get a lot. I get a lot. So I think it's really interesting that for everybody that thinks that just everything's predicated around Tesla, it's not. I mean, I think there are, Tesla's a very, very big piece. I would say if I had to make a pie chart, I would say Tesla's probably 35%. Well, um, let's ahead. talk about that. Let's talk about who's moving here for Tesla. I think it's a manufacturing heavy move, which means all the people that are buying investments the rent, the people that need to rent because they don't know how long their jobs are going to be here, here for. Yeah. That's a large portion of the Tesla population that's relocated. I want to give a quick shout out to Princess G. Um, I just want to say thank you. We listed our home in February, perfect time uh, because of uh, uh, because of all your advice back in January. Thank you. Awesome, Princess G. It's awesome. If you're li listed it right now, you might have made a little bit more, but you also might wait a heck of a lot longer and been super stressed out. I don't know. But uh, you did good there. Um, Ian. So, all right. So here, here you go, everybody. I moved to Dripping Springs. There you go. I didn't turn it off this time. I just told you. Uh, for the longest time, my wife and I did not want to move. We love where we live in South Austin. I love Circle C. I love uh, our specific neighborhood. Unfortunately, the schools became an issue for me. Uh, they just so much to the point we try to do private schools and it didn't work. Um, there you go. So we moved to Dripping Springs and I sold in that. 
I sold my house pretty much at the coming down the peak and I bought a house in the exact peak. So Ian, you are hundred percent right. People either do things for love or money. There you go. That's I did it. not do it for money. Tell you that. That's it. That's how it is. And that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. Good. And you know, I bought in a peak moment too, but there's still an opportunity. There's always an opportunity because if there's a peak for the purchase, you also have a peak for a sale. I didn't sell, but you have a peak for that. So <laughs> they don't believe me. Ian. <laughs> I know that's really funny. Uh, I did not move to Dallas to rent downtown to make videos talking about the market crashing. Tell you that. Uh, say hello to Lance. Does he live out there? I don't even know. Anthony, what's up, man? Good to see you again. It's been a while. Hey, Anthony, we need to bring you back on because I want to talk about uh, uh, are people able to reduce their taxes now that prices are coming down? I want to hear from you on that. Uh, Ian, what else you got, man? This has been fun. That was a good conversation with him. I know people go a little wild, um, but I like to have some Ian time. Oh man. I'm just, I'm looking at all these articles, all these, all these questions from people that are coming back and forth. And, um, Man, I, I just, I've had such weird situations going on. It's, not, it's story time. I had another situation today where these people bought a property or put in an offer for a property. We found out that uh, the tax record was incorrect and they've been charged as if it was a three acre property, but the entire time it was only a two and a half acre property. Wow. Right. So the, so the sellers didn't know this. So they didn't, they didn't know they signed the survey and everything. They didn't know to, they didn't look at the numbers. And so uh, in this case, it was Williamson County has been charging them that extra half acres worth of taxes for the last uh, six, seven years. And that, and we're finding that out as on the buyer side. <laughs> Isn't that fun? It's fun. That's, that's a tough part. I mean, like the, the house we purchased, they had uh, I think over 65 exemption on it, I think. And so like, I don't even know what's going to happen with our taxes this year. That's the biggest thing. I'm like, great. I just sold a house. I had, I mean, I had really high taxes here, but I'm buying even higher taxes over there. Um, but thankfully it wasn't a 3% tax rate. Like most people do. It was uh 2.4, 2.35, somewhere around there. Uh, people miss Kevin. I mean, if you want Kevin back on the show, just drop comments. It says, bring back the metaverse guy. We'll bring him back. I mean, we'll bring Kevin back. We've, he, we he disappeared when crypto crashed. Listen, yeah. I, I don't know, man. I've got some crypto that's doing very well. Let me just say it that way. You're doing well in crypto and right NFTs. Now? NFTs. NFTs. That are doing really oh, yeah. Well. Uh, let's see. Uh, I saw some off market listings in my area. It's not, a, it is, is that a good tactic to create? desirability when there's some weakening in the market. No, I just think people don't want their home accumulating days on market. I have two off market properties right now. Um, I moved to Georgetown. Fun fact. I moved to Georgetown. Not did not move to Georgetown. Uh, uh, we need, uh, yeah. Dinosaur D loves his mullet. He had to change his guy too. I know um, he can't support it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so we'll bring we'll bring him back on. So here's what's going to happen over the next few weeks because we're I'm in the process of moving. Ian's uh, doing vacation stuff, so we won't be on next week. The following week after that, we'll be on. The week after that, we're going to alternate for a couple weeks here. I was going to say the week off. after that, I'm in Colombia. Yeah, yeah. Mexico, so Colombia. we're talking about people, people traveling. So where where have you been recently? I was just in Utah. No, I did not pick up another wife. I was uh, talking. Uh, <laughs> I was talking about all of this stuff, housing market stuff, predictions and stuff like that with realtors. But uh, in fact, uh, where was he on here? He was, this guy right here took me on a $27 million property tour. Um, Cameron. Yeah, yeah. Cameron took me on a $27 million property tour in Utah. It was the coolest thing I've ever seen. Cameron, what's up if you're still on, man? Um, that was so much fun. But where have you been? What's been going on? Where are you going? Where am I going? I'm going everywhere, man. Mexico. Everywhere the world takes me. Uh, John, John hair asked a good question. I, I kind of like it. I want to. Are you getting hair one. implants in Mexico? Is that what's happening? Hair implants. I'm getting some <laughs> chipped teeth fixed. 
Uh, I bought a house with a mother-in-law apartment last year. I rented a mother-in-law apartment for eighteen hundred. Holy shit! Yeah. So, so uh, yes, I is when I discovered when I discovered some of these and their loopholes and ways to build these next gen or these uh, ADU homes, I was I'm like I said that to everybody. Why wouldn't you buy this? Why wouldn't you buy this? Why? Wouldn't you? Well, but the builder doesn't make doesn't necessarily make much more money. What it does is it's an increased demand, right? But um, in a lot of neighborhoods, I've seen that they've done maybe 5% of their homes were this type of home where they had the mother-in-law apartment. I think it's a huge opportunity for people if they can get one of those still. <laughs> Brandon Bruss said, I'm wrong for that comment. Show him your hair. He has hair. It was a whole joke. It was a joke. Come on, random. <laughs> It's because nobody thinks he has hair. That's why I said that. I didn't even hear what you said. <laughs> I said, are you going to Mexico for hair implants? Oh, okay. Okay. <laughs> so, well, cool. All right. It's been a long night. I appreciate everybody jumping on. Um, I appreciate everybody that's very cordial. WFG is a, a great title company here in Austin. I love them. So um, great people there. So uh, it was great to have... Um, Pat on uh, and go over his knowledge. I mean, he had a 73 page uh, slide thing. And if we'd have gone through that, we'd still be going through it. So um, he's amazing. So uh, I appreciate everybody. We'll catch you on the flip. Ian, last words. Uh, buy a house right now. It's the best time. <laughs>